Good afternoon. Welcome to Southampton. Welcome to the Turner Sims and welcome to the 2023 Stag Lecture. It's a thrill to welcome many of you from schools and local area, many wonderful colleagues, uh, honoured guests uh, and everybody else who's joining both in person and online. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know what Stag is, and I suspect that's 99% of the people in this audience, uh, I'm the director of Stag. My name is Dr. Matthew Middleton. I tend to work on black hole astrophysics, plus some other more unusual things. Uh, and I'm very fortunate to be the sort of the, the, the lead or the one who's trying to direct um, people from three different research groups between two faculties. So we have the Department of Mathematical Sciences within the Faculty of Social Sciences, and we also have the Physics Department uh, from the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences. So we have actually three groups. We have, and this is what makes up STAG, we have um, astronomy, gravity, and theory. Theory is sort of the high energy physics. And it's, it's really great to work between these sorts of disciplines because there's really exciting science that happens at these interfaces. A great example of this is that Southampton is becoming a hub for research into gravitational waves. And I just want to show of hands who knows about gravitational waves. Okay, twiddles everybody. I'm an astronomer, so order of magnitude is fine. Um, so Southampton is going to become one of these hubs for studying gravitational waves, both theoretically, led by our colleagues in maths, and also observationally, or also in physics as well. The theory group are also doing some fantastic work on predictions for gravitational waves, and also observationally. So we're bringing these things together and exploring some really fascinating areas of science. So what else does STAG do besides promote science at the interface between these great groups? We organize masterclasses. So for those of you who are below the drinking age, uh, we have masterclasses where we have scientists who discuss our research online and try and tell you how great it is to be an undergraduate here. And it is great being an undergraduate here. Okay, we also organize seminars, workshops, and of course, this lecture itself. So we have this one major lecture. I'm going to be bold and say this is the, the most important lecture that the university uh, has. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Smith. Uh, and uh, it's a great thrill because we always bring in someone who's going to talk about something really exciting. We've had a long list of, of high-end scientists, including Nobel laureates, and today's uh, is absolutely no exception. And we're going to talk, we're going to be hearing all about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all these things that either fill you full of dread or fill you full of excitement or a mixture of the two. Now, before we get there, I want to, or we're going to present a few prizes. So every STAG lecture, we present prizes to students within each of the three groups who have published some outstanding work over the course of the preceding years. Now, I'm not going to be presenting this. Uh, we're going to have Professor Rebecca Hoyle presenting this. Rebecca, thank you. Uh, who is the Associate Vice President of Interdisciplinary Research. I had to write that down. So please welcome Rebecca. It's such a lovely thing to be able to give prizes. I'm very, very happy about this. So um, the STAG prizes, the first one. Um, the 2023 STAG Publication Prize for High Energy Physics is awarded to Shubhani Jain for her work on assessing the performance of different jet clustering algorithms in probing the physics of the Higgs boson at the LHC. Her work allows tests of the standard model and could potentially help identify beyond standard model physics. The 2023 STAG Publication Prize in Gravitational Physics is awarded jointly to Christopher Whittle and Thomas Hutchins. In his work, Chris studied the self-force experienced by scalar charges when they scatter off a black hole. This work enables the application of frequency domain techniques to problems with unbounded orbits, opening up possibilities of exploring the interplay between different modern approaches used to study the gravitational dynamics of celestial bodies. Tom's work, Gravitational Radiation from Thermal Mountains on Accreting Neutron Stars, Sources of Temperature Non-Axi Symmetry, studies how the shapes of neutron stars lose their symmetry due to temperature fluctuations inside them. Tom's work demonstrates that neutron stars are viable sources of continuous gravitational radiation. Uh, 
The 2023 Stag Publication Prize in Astronomy is awarded to Cordelia Dashwood Brown. Cordelia is awarded the Astrophysics Prize for her theoretical work on black holes. Mass is one of the fundamental properties of black holes, but is notoriously difficult to measure. Cordelia has developed a new method to measure black hole masses using X-rays. The novel method uses the irradiation of a companion star to determine the mass of the black hole. This promising technique has the potential to unveil for the first time the masses of black holes that have not been probed before due to residing in obscured regions of the galaxy. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and congratulations to all those people who received prizes. I'm sure everyone in the audience completely comprehended what they were receiving their prizes for. I, of course, did. Um, brilliant. So, um, so we're now up to the, the point of the lecture itself. Um, so I'm not going to do this introduction. We're very fortunate to have our Vice Chancellor, Professor Mark Smith, giving the introduction. Please welcome our Vice Chancellor. Yes, so good, good afternoon, everyone, and it's a huge privilege to be here. First, can I add my congratulations to the uh, winners? Um, because one of the great privileges of being a vice chancellor is actually seeing the fantastic range of work that goes on, and it's the work that's done by my colleagues as members of staff, but also the student research students that effectively uh, makes university such a really exciting experience. So, congratulations uh, to all of those colleagues for your your work. Uh, my main my main event though my main task at this event is to actually introduce our, our very eminent speaker. It's my great pleasure to do so uh, because this year's stag lecture is going to be on machine learning and artificial intelligence as applied to major scientific areas of research. Uh, and so one could wonder, given uh, the very precise definition of what a stag applies to, why uh, we've got a, a a, a talk on machine learning and AI. It's because effectively that uh, many of the areas of physics and uh, mathematics that we're concerned with under STAG actually deal with the really large data sets. And as you know, the whole push of machine learning and AI is to make more sense and to create new knowledge out of large data sets. And that's the area which we're going uh, to explore in this, uh, in this talk. Now, AI is of significant, and you don't need to, to meet us, you just read the paper every day, uh, of growing importance in the world. Uh, and therefore, having someone who can talk to us about AI and machine learning in the context of scientific research is, is hugely appropriate. But of course, there's many other things that AI is used for, such as, for example, chat GPT. Um, and uh, I'll let you into a little secret here. Uh, I don't write these notes. Um, uh, someone else uh, actually does the work and all I have to do is stand up and uh, uh, kind of deliver them. But what they decided to do is a little experiment, uh, which is a, what a, a university should do. And we ran Tony Hay through chat GPT. And I'm not going to read out exactly everything it says, but I checked with Tony uh, beforehand some of the facts. And I'm glad to say some of them are completely wrong. Uh, so that's where chat GPT leads you is into the completely wrong average. But nevertheless, it did a reasonable job. Uh, Tony is definitely a prominent figure in the world of computer science uh, and technology and has made many significant uh, contributions in the field of computing uh, and e-science. And he's extremely well known for his uh, contributions to areas such as parallel computing, data intensive science uh, and e-research. Uh, he's held notable positions across both academia and industry, uh, and in particular, uh, being the vice president of Microsoft Research Connections, which was a role to connect Microsoft with the world uh, of academia through collaborative re research, and heavily involved, therefore, in the development of e-science as a paradigm uh, and use of that technology to enable collaborative research in data-intensive uh, areas. Before that time at Microsoft, 
In fact, this was the first, I didn't know Tony at the time, it was the first time I knew of him uh, was when he became the director of the UK e-science initiative, which was funded by the, uh, the research councils, which was, uh, I think, a very forward-looking initiative at the time to look at developing the UK's e-science infrastructure to allow these areas to make use of computing where there was data intensive uh, requirements. He has held positions at a number of universities, Oxford uh, and Caltech, and has also been a, a researcher at CERN. But for this audience, uh, his most important role, I would say this, his most important role was he was a very important member of staff here uh, at the University of Southampton, uh, playing a very key role uh, in shaping parts of this university for which we are still very grateful for uh, at the university. He has authored several papers and influential books on the topic of e-science and information technology uh, and is well known for his, his contributions. So there is no doubt that uh, he's a, a recognized uh, global authority in bridging this gap between academia, industry and government in this realm of large data sets, e-science e and computing. That's been recognized in several, formally, in several ways. For example, an honorary doctorate from this university, which we're very pleased to give him. He was made a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in 2001, and in 2005, he was given a, a, a CBE. So with that, I think I need to make, delay no longer the main event and introduce our 2023 stag lecturer, Professor Tony Hay. Tony. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Yeah, I wonder where you got the error from, and it's ChatGPT. Yeah, well, there you are. I'll talk about ChatGPT in this talk. Um, I, I first came to Southampton nearly 50 years ago. I was in physics originally, and then moved to uh, electronics and computer science, and I moved into computer science. But today I'm going to talk about um, some things which are really current now and affecting all of us and will affect all of your lives. So. Uh, I'm going to specialize to applying to science, but I'll also talk in more generally about what ChatGPT and, and, and these large language models, as they're called, what they can do and what they can't do. But let me start, first of all, with um, time convince you that today it isn't, you know, a typically lone researcher in his lab doing some experiments, getting out a USB for all the data. Um, uh, no, it's actually uh, data intensive science. and. Uh, I'd like this to talk a little bit about my colleague at Microsoft, um, Jim Gray. And here's a picture of Jim Gray on his boat. It was the same boat that he was lost at sea uh, a year later. Uh, and this picture appears all over the internet and just shows you know what the internet's like. Everybody uses it. I happen to know it's mine because here, that's my daughter-in-law's knee. All right. So uh, it's, it's where you, I watermark this, this, this image. Uh, so much of science is now data intensive and people talk about the four V's. That's um, uh, here, velocity, uh, sorry, volume, variety, velocity and veracity. Uh, so the volume is clearly how much data you have. Uh, the variety is what type of data, is it images, is it text, is it sort of uh, other types of calculations. Uh, velocity, if it's a streaming data from a sensor, how much comes in per second. And veracity is how much you can show that you know what this data actually measures, where it comes from, and have a whole track of its, its, its uh, origins and, and validity. And so typically, uh, there are some people, most people are doing small science experiments, typically in a university lab, for example. And then there are some who are looking at larger data sets with, in small groups across universities, across uh, countries, for example. And then there are these big uh, uh, major experiments like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, where you have groups of, of, of a thousand scientists working on a problem. And, and I'll give some examples of, of those sorts of things. But those uh, are typically where data comes in. So this is, uh, in the old days, when they took astronomy, they used to take plates, pictures of, the, of the, the things, and you can still find these plates carefully stored in astronomy departments around the world. Uh, 
for example, I know the one at Harvard, they've been digitizing them. They, they hadn't finished it, but I, last time I, I talked to them. But this is um, the first digital version of that. And it was the Sloan Digital Sci Survey, and it was, it was really set, set a huge precedent on how to do digital science in astronomy. Uh, and uh, whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Whoops, here we go back. Um, the data is public, so you can all go and see it. it. has nice pictures of images. This is the telescope, uh, and it started in 1992, and it, it's never finished. The data is you spend a lot of millions to get the data. You'd like to actually use it, and so you can actually still go and download it and, and actually go and search it for new things, and people are still issuing papers based on it. And in these days, uh, 40 terabytes, all right? So you're used to megabytes, maybe gigabytes, well, terabytes is another thousand up, and petabytes is a thousand more than that. So typically, uh, you don't deal with petabytes on computers, rarely terabytes, but hundreds of megabytes, uh, certainly in gigabytes, one deals with. And so in the end, this, 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 this experiment produced 35 terabytes of, of catalog data. Uh, and uh, you can still see it. There's a, a web service built by Jim Gray and astronomer Alex Sarley. So this led Jim Gray to, to, to give a talk, a very influential talk in the US. Uh, this is the last talk he gave a few weeks before he died, uh, down at sea. Uh, and basically, he, he, he described thousands of years ago, people were looking at the stars and working out the planets and things like that, um, not the planets. Well, yes, the planets compared to the stars, the planets were moving, uh, and that was experimental science in a way. And then since Newton's laws, Maxwell's laws, the Schrodinger equation, we were able to do theoretical science so we could actually do some calculations to understand where we were, what we were going to see and understand what the data, can we explain the data using these equations? And so that was the way we've done science for many hundreds of years using experimental and theory in tandem together. But in 1950 or so, we invented computers, right? It's a very recent invention. And a Nobel Prize winner called Ken Wilson called that the third paradigm. So there are two ways you do science, these two paradigms, experiment and theory. But there's another way now where you can actually go and do modeling. And you can say, well, I can't do the experiment, but I could actually write a computer simulation to see what it would, would get if I use these laws of physics to do that. And so modeling, uh, it becomes an important part. And to do that, you need to know about computers, computer architecture, software, how to program, what languages are appropriate and so on. It's a different set of skills in addition to knowing the science uh, and the data. Right? So it involves all three and that they call the third paradigm. Jim Gray would distinguish data intensive science as a fourth way of doing science. And it involves you know, data from all sorts, instruments, simulations, sensor networks, all piling in huge amounts of data. And you're trying to make sense of it. And actually, it's a, not just writing a program. It's not just doing a theory calculation for Maxwell's equations. It's actually a different type of science. You have to know how to manage a petabyte, how to organize it, how to reorganize it, how to visualize it, how to analyze it. And so, uh, that's what Jim Gray felt that scientists now have a fourth set of skills, a fourth paradigm, which he called data intensive science. And the things we worked on in the UK under e-science, which was a form of data science, recognizing that data was becoming a very important component of modern experiments, was the tools for doing analysis, data mining, visualization, and so on. These are the tools that came from the data science initiative. And nowadays, for example, you see books like this. This is a book by an astronomer, uh, Andrew Connolly and colleagues, Statistics, Data Mining, Machine Learning in Astronomy, something similar in the environmental sciences. And this is another method, Bayesian methods in, in bioinformatics. So these are the sort of books that people have to read to make sense of their data. OK, so that was the history of the fourth paradigm. What I'd like to do now is, is say something about um, the next generation of experiments. I've talked about the first digital survey of the sky. So what are the new experiments that people are doing? Well, the new experiment, this is the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. It's in some mountaintop in the Atacama Desert up in the northern Chile. 
and it's a beautiful place in a rather bleak desert, has very little rainfall. And their goal is to do a survey like the Sloan Digital Survey, but every night. So you do a huge survey of the night sky, all the stars you can see in the night sky, and then you do it again next night and the next night. And by looking at the ones you took last night and this night, you can see if anything changes, these transient things, you can see something appeared, something disappeared, and you can then go and, this is in the optical where we put normal telescopes, but you can then look in the infrared, the radio telescopes, and increasingly now with these gravity wave detectors. And, and this is the idea of this is to do this for 10 years and get a huge catalog, much, much bigger than the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, instead of 35 terabytes, 50 petabytes of images and stuff. And it's looking at dark energy, dark matter, solar system, uh, transients, things that change on, on a time scale, a very close time scale, and also mapping uh, the Milky Way in much, much more detail. So that's in the visible wavelengths of light. There's also now a project in, in an uh, international project, mainly in Europe and Australia, uh, called the Square Kilometre Array, and that's in the radio uh, telescope arrays. And so this is the one in South Africa in the Karoo region, it's a sort of semi-arid region north of Cape Town, and it's, it's a radio quiet area. And this is a similar thing in Western Australia, and they're looking at low frequencies and high mid, middle range frequencies in, in, in this particular uh, telescope, uh, uh, radio astronomy. And they have, again, big ambitions. This is the, from their webpage, the SKA Observatory, and they want to look at cosmic dawn, obviously checking relativity, Einstein's equations and so on, cosmology and dark energy. So those are big experiments and they're going to produce many, many hundreds of petabytes of data because you're measuring the whole of the night sky every night on these experiments. And actually man handling them, analyzing them is going to be a huge challenge. And they, they haven't started yet, but that will be one of the challenges, having the skills to manage and look after all this data. And this is, of course, the Large Hadron Collider. This is one of the experiments. This is the Atlas experiment here. And they have uh, two particles coming in, crash, produce all sorts of particles. And that's what you're measuring here, uh, these tracks coming out of the interaction. And what they're looking for uh, are, are new particles that are not, we don't yet fully understand. And so, whoops, I want this one. This. Uh, for example, the Higgs boson has just been found just been found a few years ago. Uh, and this is one of its decay modes. And, and here it's uh, into Tor plus Tor minus mesons, which are sort of heavy electrons. Uh, and the blue is what's the, the, the Higgs boson and all the rest is, is background. So can you determine that blue peak in your data? And the question is how do you, from all the mass of data you've got, can you pick out this particular uh, Stuff And there was a Higgs challenge where there was a, a challenge they gave a data set and what was the best way to see if you could find that peak and that people use machine learning techniques to do that. So that was in 2014. And uh, this is now what they're doing now. They've increased the luminosity and improved the Hadron Collider and it's just restarted after a shutdown of some years. And this new high luminosity version of the Large Hadron Collider, instead of just 3 million collected a year, it'll produce 15 million. So it'll produce huge numbers of events, and we'll understand in much more detail exactly how the, this particular boson decays and so on. So those are uh, things relevant to STAG because they're astronomy, astrophysics, uh, and, and particle physics, and gravity. But there's also other areas, and this is um, one that the National Science Foundation, NSF, in the US are doing. Uh, and it's the Ocean Observatory Initiative. So obviously I live part of my time in Seattle, that's where Microsoft's based. And I have this wonderful house on the lake and so you know, it's, it's a very beautiful place to live and they have wonderful mountains. So I recommend you go there. Um, but this, they put optical fibers on the seabed there and they study videos and stuff coming in. So they have data pouring in from these optical fibers on the seabed 24 hours a day. And this just shows you the sort of things they've got five arrays, uh, 900 instruments, 45 different types, 
200 different parameters of the seabed and, and, and the ocean environment. So I won't go through this in detail, but you've got 70 missions. They've got, uh, uh, where do I want to find something? Gliders, uh, 200 different parameters, 900 instruments. 70 scientists, engineers and staff just maintaining this infrastructure for people to do science. So people can take some data from this and take it back to their university if they can store it on their university system, because it can be large amounts of data and uh, analyze what's happening in the ocean, which of course is extremely important nowadays. And then the other part is actually measuring things with satellites. And these are just things uh, are now fully operation, these sentinel satellites. And as you can see, they'll, they'll generate terabytes of data a day, but they'll operate 365 and produce large amounts of data. And the question is, how do you get the science out of that data? And just to show the worldwide growth of, of data in the climate science, which is extremely interesting to us because of climate change, uh, just look at the slide here. The, the blue is what the, the amount of data coming in the next few years from radar and satellites. And in addition, you're doing simulation and modeling of the climate and data uh, weather, and that will produce this much data. So we're going to get, oh, and this little bit in green here, are other bits of data, like they have measurement buoys in various places in the sea, but it's a tiny amount of data compared to the satellite data and to the simulation data. So um, big data in ocean science, in climate science, and also, of course, in, in bioinformatics. And I'm not going to go through this. this is, I'll talk a little bit about protein structures and things later on. But this, again, huge amounts of data, including all these things. So this used not to be, in bio, a big data field. It's becoming a big data field since we solved the human genome and so on. Right, OK. So I hope that convinces you that you're not going to be able to take your data home on a USB stick, all right, uh, because it's going to be too big. And whether your university can manage the data you're bringing home is a challenge. And I, I need to check whether Southampton can do that. But I think they can because they have some pioneers in these areas. OK, so what I'd like to talk about is the deep learning revolution, because um, there has been a revolution in AI techniques, and it goes by the name of deep learning. What do I mean by deep learning? Well, there are many machine learning methods that people can use. It's not, you know, people have been using this for many years. Uh, and so there's things like random forests, Bayesian networks, k-means, support vector machine, decision trees, all of which are useful and in certain things, and they've been used a lot. But I'd just like to highlight one of the ones that was just one of many tools that you could use which is based on neural networks. So what do I mean by neural networks? Well, they're artificial neurons, but they're based sort of vaguely on how your neurons in your brain work. So just to give you a quick introduction to what I mean by that. So this is an example of what's called a, a basic neuron, the perceptron, if you like. Two inputs, we send a signal down there. You have two weights here. X, X, when you multiply a weight on this one and a weight on this one, and they add them together and feed them into a decision. And this only sends a signal beyond it if it's above a certain threshold. So uh, what you have, the neuron only fires if the combined inputs add up to more than a threshold value. And that's sort of how your neurons in your brain. It was one of the very early models of uh, uh, computers many years ago when they were still talking about computers in the 1940s and 50s. Um, so that's, a, that's what I'm talking about, neurons, neural networks, they're made of these units, right? Uh, and then they're put into networks. What's a network? Well, you have two of these units. These are neuron, neuron, a neuron, neuron, and a neuron here. And you have an input here, which you feed into this neuron, along with an input from this neuron, neuron and and this will fire only if it gets above a threshold and similarly with this and you have a weight here and a weight here and a weight here and a weight here which you multiply those by and then you get an output here again from from these you add these together with the, their weights multiplying them and you get an output and from that what you're trying to do is to see if you can teach a network to recognize for example a chimpanzee 
So it only gives a signal if a chimpanzee is in the picture and so on. So you have to train it and you have to set the weights so that it tells you chimpanzee at the end rather than buffalo or something like that. And uh, the clever thing that there is, there's a method of, of, of changing the weights here uh, depending, this is the wrong answer, so you can see how wrong it is, and then you can change the weights on the way back to the input and try again and see if that gives you a better improvement. It's called back propagation. So that's what a, a very simplistic network is. So the big development happened with a, with a set of uh, challenge. I talked about the Higgs challenge. This is an image net challenge. So this was Professor Fei Fei Li of Stanford was collecting images where you could test your uh, computer vision. Every computer scientist like to build things to, to see if they can recognize this or do this and do that. And this is a way of testing computer vision systems. And so is yours better than mine and so on. And so it was a, a whole image data sets which were organized with various uh, concepts and words. And they provided a thousand images of each type which had been labeled, this is a gibbon, this is a, a duck, and so on. And they were labeled by people. Uh, they used a thing called Mechanical Turk, and she paid them to actually go and classify these, these this thousand set of images, what, what the image was. And so that was this data set that they used. And uh, they then, having trained them on a thousand, uh, each of these concepts, and there were many of them, they, were, they gave you a much larger set, and could you then correctly uh, identify the images? And the things were very detailed. And so this was what it was. So you had pictures of birds, and so it wasn't just any bird, flamingo, cock, ruffled grouse, quail, partridge, or cats, for example. So 1.2 million images it was trained on. All right. And what, what, what they wanted to do was compare how your computer vision system that you developed at the University of so-and-so how did it against somebody else and other universities or industry? And this is what happened. So this is the error rate, all right? So at first, the computer science vision systems made 28% errors compared to what a human error rate, which is around 5%. So these were not very good. And they did this competition every year from 2010 and it went down 2%. There was a few more years before that, and it went down not very much. But this is the key one here to 2012, where it dropped by 10%. So why did it drop by 10%? Um, and they weren't necessarily using neural networks. You could use anyone you liked, but this one used neural networks here. And furthermore, the network I showed previously had only what are called one intermediate layer, one hidden layer, and this one had several hidden layers and used these things called graphical processing unit. They're things in your games machines. And it was just that the mathematics could take advantage of these specialized processes called GPUs, graphical processing unit. And so this one here got used neural networks and GPUs, and they produced a 10% improvement. And then it's continued on and other competitors then started using GPUs. And as you can see, that's why NVIDIA are one of the most valuable countries, companies anywhere, because they make all these GPUs that you have in your games and things. But they also now have a big market selling to the scientific community for doing chat GPT and things like this. So we went then from a simple network. I showed you a very simple one. You have input layer, output layer, and a hidden layer to many hidden layers. And that's what deep means. You've got these many hidden layers. And here I've shown ev every neuron here connected to everyone in the middle. You don't have, you can just connect some of them. So there are many possible choices for the connectivity of these networks. But basically you have an input layer and an output layer. And you want to teach it to, for example, recognize a number plate, recognize a person's face, recognize an image. And, and if you don't get, you have an input and it doesn't give the right answer. You then retune all, the, all the, the weights until you get the right answer. And then you declare your network trained, which you can then use for the police to record my speeding on my way to the Rutherford lab, for example, which I'm particularly annoyed about. Um, uh, does anybody know what the definition of average speed limit is? You, you can talk about that over coffee. Uh, okay, so deep neural network is that. Uh, and... Uh, 
here's the classification error rate where we are now. It started 28%, 28, 26%, and it went down. And now you see, this is a human error rate. And now these systems are comparable or better than human errors, than human, humans at, at identifying these images, all right? And these now, as you notice, have 150 hidden layers between the input and the output. So that's the, how the complexity has come. Now, you can ask, you know, we don't fully understand why they work so well. Um, and this is a slide from one of the promoters of this, Andrew Ung, he's at Stanford. Uh, and you can tell it's a marketing slide because it, it doesn't have any units anywhere on here. So it's clearly marketing. But nonetheless, the point is this, that uh, you notice he claims that the older learning algorithms that I showed you actually saturate as the amount of data, they don't get better in performance, but deep learning keeps improving the more data you have. And that's the key thing. The huge amounts of data and the huge amounts of compute have made a great difference. Neural networks were always one possibility, but they've turned out when you have massive amounts of data, massive amounts of compute, that they really win out. And that's why people are so excited. And uh, you say, well, why do I care? Well, deep learning, is now routinely used by these IT companies. So th these are the IT companies, quote, that matter, all right? So this is Google, this is one of their data centers, this is Microsoft's data center, this is actually, that's Amazon's headquarters in Seattle where I live, uh, and this is, this is Facebook, now known as Meta, uh, and the Apple is sort of just makes the fifth position and then alongside this, you could put the Chinese companies, that would be uh, Alibaba, Huawei, uh, Tencent, and Baidu, which would be the equivalents of these. So those are the major ones. And so Europe is very worried that it doesn't have anything to compete. That's because it costs many billions of dollars to build these centers, and you have to build them all over the world. And so each of these companies have building data centers as fast as they can, because European countries, for example, insist their data is held in their country. So you have to build a data center in their country, for the data that the government cares about being held in their country, and so on. So very few companies can do that, and those are the, they're called hyperscaler countries companies, these hyperscalers, these are the hyperscalers. And what they use, uh, they use for all these sort of tasks. They can do human level classification of images, speech recognition, handwriting transcription, translation, all, all these sort of language type things. But they can also do uh, autonomous driving. They can also, as you know, though not perfect yet, they can do natural language questions. You can say, you know, please play so-and-so to Spotify or whatever. and um, Google's DeepMind subsidiary in the UK, we all know about chess. It's a, a, a complicated game, but computers can beat chess. Well, Go is a much more complicated. It's playing on a 19 by 19 board and has many more possibilities. And it's, it's, it's difficult to actually formulate end games and begin games and so openings and so on. But, but they now can beat the best human Go player. And uh, in particular, the group that invented these deep learning networks had a guy named Jeffrey Hinton, I'll come back to him later, he's a professor in Canada. He and his two students wrote that paper. And he says, well, no, no point in training for radiologists to look at cancer images because computers can do it better. You know, and that was his view. I think it's slightly, uh, a slightly exaggerated view in my view. Uh, but these guys, here they are. This is Jeffrey Hinton. And this is Terry Sishnowski. And they were working in this little tiny area called neural networks. Where everybody else was doing all this other AI stuff and everybody ignored them. They were completely forgotten for 20 years. And then they suddenly win. And that's what this book by Terry Sishnowski says, sort of says, first half of the book is, we told you so, all right? Uh, and um, it's, it's, of course, easy to be right in retrospect, but, but in fact, they were right. Uh, and he, he believes it was big data. I think it also means big compute as well. And that's why it's going to have an influence on us. But just so as you know, that we don't fully understand it. Uh, and we're not, it, it does work and it's used every day by the IT companies, but it would be nice to have a better understanding of why it works. And is it gonna work? Is that the best you can get? What's the error on that? Those are questions that still we don't know. 
And these are another little things uh, you can do. It's called adversarial noise. So uh, here is a picture of a panda and the system identifies that with 60% confidence. Now you actually sprinkle a bit of noise on that image and it gives you this image. Well, it still looks like a panda to me, but the system you've trained to recognize pandas with large numbers of images of pandas now says that's a gibbon with 99% confidence, slightly concerning. And similarly, you can do things like this, all right? So you've trained it to recognize bananas. There's a banana, all right? We all know it's a banana. You showed it thousands of photographs of bananas. But then you put this little patch by it on sticker on the thing. It now thinks it's a toaster, all right? So you might be worried by some of these things, and you should be. So let's, not all is done, and there's plenty for you to do uh, to fix these problems. All right. I just spent 10 years in the States and I still live there half the time. Uh, so I'd like to give you a US perspective uh, on, on what they're doing in the US. And in particular, since I now work at the UK's national laboratory, uh, this, the US have these national laboratories that have 17 of them uh, all around the US. And uh, these are the weapons labs, Los Alamos, Sandia and Lawrence Livermore. And the ones that, that I work with are the open labs, Lawrence Berkeley, uh, Oak Ridge and Argonne and Brookhaven to some extent. And they all have big uh, experimental apparatus like X-ray machines, neutron sources and so on. And Berkeley invented the new way of doing science. And this came about because they first built the first cyclotron, which could accelerate particles. So then you could use not cosmic rays to find things out, but you could use particles coming from this accelerator. And this is how they found, for example, the first antiproton was discovered here. And so this is what it takes to do that. This is where the machine, this is the, the magnet yoke for the machine, which was here. And this is, you know, uh, that is, I believe, Mr. Oppenheimer, uh, and that's Lawrence. Uh, and this, I forget, is, uh, anyway, uh, Lawrence and Oppenheimer have a long history and they were at Berkeley together. And I do recommend you go and see the new film Oppenheimer. It's a really interesting film, despite the fact that it misses out the key contribution made by my old professor at Oxford, uh, Rudolf Piles. He and a, a German refugee who was marooned in Birmingham because the war broke out and he couldn't go back to Denmark. Um, they talked to each other and they said, well, you know, in uranium-238, the only active element for producing fission is uranium-235, but that's a tiny percentage of what's in uranium. But Frisch asked Piles the question, what would you do if we had pure uranium-235? And Piles had a formula he'd been working out for critical masses, so he put it in and said, well, we only need a couple of pounds, and they realized that was doable. So there's a plaque in Birmingham to the fact that they invented atom bombs uh, in Birmingham. Mm. Uh, it does sound unlikely, but it's true. Uh, and of course, Piles recruited uh, another German refugee called Klaus Fuchs with him and took him with him to Los Alamos. And Klaus Fuchs was a spy who gave Stalin and Beria the, the copy of the, the atomic bomb, the plutonium bomb. Uh, and he was a German refugee, but unlike Piles and Frisch, he was not a Jew. He was a communist, and that was the reason why he left Germany. Okay, so that's Berkeley in the old days. You require a team of people. So that's like what CERN has become, is, is a much larger team of people. Uh, and now at Berkeley Lab, which is Lawrence Berkeley, uh, uh, Lawrence's lab at Berkeley, Ernest Lawrence, you have uh, lots of facilities like light sources, X-rays, like lasers, you have gene sequences, you have telescopes, you have particle detectors, uh, and uh, what's to say? Microscopes, yes. So you have all these clever sources now, which are all automated, produce lots of data. You have lots of computers. These are the latest computers they have there. Uh, the latest one is not here, actually, it's called Perlmutter, after the latest Nobel Prize winner. Uh, and, and they want to put applied maths and computer science and analytics to understand this. And they'd like to connect it all together. And that's where users come from universities to take data uh, and, and then do analysis of the data. And this is the way to help them do that. 
So that's what that does. And then just to mention a couple of others, this is what an exascale computer looks like. This is the world's first exascale computer, fills a gigantic room, all right? And it, it uses, you know, 1.1 exaflops. Well, a megaflop is a million floating point operations per second. That's a multiplier of divide per second. Uh, so it's a megaflop. And then there's a, a gigaflop, which is a thousand times more, and a teraflop. And then we get to a petaflop. And, and then after a petaflop, we get to exaflop. So it's a huge number of calculations per second, far faster than any human possibly do. Using this, when you have, you know, uh, typically things, these things have tens of thousands of those things called GPUs. How do you make use of them? You have to program that very carefully, and it's a very complicated and difficult task to actually make it really uh, exploit that power. Uh, and this is, again, this is a view of Aurora's machine, um, which is almost built. Uh, and this is the sort of things you have there, uh, the cooling and the wiring. It's, it's a huge enterprise to do that. But what they do at the labs is very interesting to me because I work at the National Lab in the UK. They have data sets which are curated. So they actually have metadata telling them what it is and how you use it. They have the most powerful computers. This is high performance computing, this acronym, maths and computer science research, user facilities. So users can go there and take data at the synchrotron. Uh, and then they also have a whole team of people they can put together on the experiments. So that's what they've been doing in the US. In the UK, I came back and nobody was interested in 2015. This is three years after 2012, when they discovered deep learning. Nobody was looking at deep learning in the UK as far as I can see. So even at the Turing Institute, nobody at the lab, I didn't meet anybody who was interested in AI and machine learning methods. And so what we started up at the lab, this is, the, this is what the lab looks like just up the road near Oxford. This is the X-ray synchrotron, the diamond light source. This is the, where they produce neutrons, neutron beams, and they actually scatter these up all sorts of things to, to determine properties of materials and so on. Uh, and this is the laser facility where they have big lasers. They also have very complicated, intricate laser machines. Uh, this is where the data from CERN comes into this building where I work. And they also have, uh, they store most of the data for the climate change uh, uh, analysis that they do ev every uh, few years. They, they store that data on the thing called Jasmine, and they also now have an electron microscopy facility, which produces lots of data as well. So these all produce huge amounts, petabytes of data. And so we're having to deal with actually managing that data, making it available in a form that scientists and users at universities can use and manage and transport it. So challenge. What we set up was a, a group, a scientific machine learning group, I called it, um, which was actually going to uh, help scientists and, and machine people understand their machines by using machine learning methods, including deep learning. All right. And so uh, we work now with ISIS, where the neutrons, this is the laser facility, diamond light source with X-rays. This is RAL Space, who produce satellites and test satellites to go in space. This is technology where they produce all sorts of new sensors. And now there's also the Rosalind Franklin Institute, which we've been working with, Center for Environmental Data Analysis, uh, uh, Astronomy Technology Center, uh, a Dirac consortium of, of uh, astronomers and, and particle physicists. So all these people we work with and, and we try and help them get their data out and understand their data. And in, in addition, we partnered with the Turing Institute where they gave us uh, 32 NVIDIA GPUs. And we've also bought some next generation ones. They're more expensive. We have some experimental systems as well. But you should understand that those machines I showed you have 10,000 or more GPUs of the next generation. So they have H100s. So we're really poor in computing resources, even at the national lab. And there are machines in this country which have maybe a hundred or possibly a thousand, but we don't have tens of thousands of these things. What we do is we work in three areas. One is to uh, analyze the data from science experiments, understand the results. Other is 
making the, the whole experiment more, more intelligent. So you can actually optimize this bit, optimize that bit using machine learning. You can do all sorts of clever things to make the, the thing more efficient and more, more rapid to get the data. And similarly, what we like to do is understand more about these AI techniques which seem to work so well, all right? So we'd like to understand that better. And what we've done, for example, is set up a scientific machine learning benchmarks, which actually in a whole variety of things where you can see whether this system, uh, the data is available and, and you can apply your favorite algorithm on this system, or you could use a different algorithm. You don't have to use deep learning, you can use something else. So we'd like to make it a little more scientific about what machine learning you do. So what I'd like to do, move towards now is things like Chat GPT, which I hope most of you have heard of, and maybe many of you have used. And um, despite the fact that it gives errors and can tell you that you know seven times five is twenty-one because it hasn't been taught to multiply, uh, and so you can correct that. But you have to be aware of using these systems. But natural language processing previously was done using. It's just text is just a series of words uh, in a particular order. And what they try and do is predict which is the likelihood of the next word. What's the most common word to do that comes after a, a particular word? And, and they do that statistically. Uh, and they use now deep neural networks. But instead of having an input and an output, they take the output and put it in again. And so it's a recurrent neural network. And that's been used to great effect uh, in natural language processing, which is how you understand text and things like that. Um, and it's replaced by various variants, but now it's been replaced by things called transformer networks, which you don't need to know the details of, but they're just like those neural networks, but connected in different ways and used in different ways. So uh, this is the architecture that what they call foundation models are using transformers and they use an optimization called attention it's nothing to do with you and I would think is attention, but, but it, it actually allows you to do all sorts of clever things and also run it on a parallel computer. So you can do part of it on here on this computer and another part on that computer and you go faster as a result. And this is the technology that produced OpenAI and ChatGPT. Google has a, a response to ChatGPT called BARD and that's uh, and lots of other companies have of similar systems. Okay, what's a foundation model? So what you can do is train your foundation model to recognize huge amounts of text. You put in, you know, all of Wikipedia, all of the internet, all this sort of data, you, text you can find, you can train it so it recognizes very well and you can actually train it so it produces really reasonable English as a result. And it does do remarkably well. Uh, and incidentally, it's the reason why Google are so ambivalent about using BARD with their Google search model, because if you do a Google search on something, you get a whole system of links along with lots of adverts, and you have to find out which is the best link to click on. What uh, something like these chat GPT and BARD could do is actually tell you what you want to know and give you much more considered things. You don't have to go and try lots of things. You can try this, you can try that, but it's, it's much more uh, dedicated. And of course, gives you much less chance of doing advertising. And that's where Google's most revenue comes from. So they're worried about cannibalizing their model of revenue. That's a Microsoft view, of course. All right, All right so um, here we have a foundation model. You have text, images, speech, structured data, all sorts of signals you can put in and you can train it and it's called a foundation model and it uses just those things i showed you the things for doing natural language processing which use these transformer networks with this technique of attention uh, trillions of these tokens if you like words uh, and you train them on large-scale computers for many weeks when i say large scale i mean things like a whole data center full of GPUs. So it's, you know, it's millions of dollars worth of computing time you'd have to pay to get this. And of course the IT companies own that so they can just do it. Uh, and GPT-4, which is the latest thing we've got at the moment, uh, has about a trillion parameters. Okay, so that's what we hope a foundation model could do. It can do uh, 
image captioning, object recognition, instruction following, information extraction, sentiment analysis, question answering. It can do a whole variety of things. You can adapt the trained model to do all of these things. And so that's what people are doing. Okay, let's go back to the US. Um, so we've had that large language models have, have, have emerged. And so what, what happened here, they had a, a, a thing in 2019 where they had a whole, what they called a town meeting, where they had thousands of, of scientists from the US labs and from the universities came together to look at what you could do with AI for science. But then between 2019 and 2022, we had large language models, which are these sort of chat GPT things, uh, and we've had protein folding. Uh, programmers are now increasingly using AI because these systems can write simple codes. So you can start your coding by you know, getting chat GPT to write a piece of code for you. Try it. Um, uh, if you want a, a, a search algorithm, you could ask it to write quicksort, and it would write program for quicksort, which was correct. You have to check whether it is correct. Uh, and, and also, you can use these things when you do a simulation on a high-performance computer. You're, you're trying to get results, uh, but you have solved equations to do that. But if you could produce results which were identical in form to the ones you got by solving the equations, which you can try and generate with this generative technology of AI, you'll be able to do uh, much more computation because it's much easier to do that and you can produce much more synthetic data uh, to go along with the, 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 the expensive data solving these differential equations. And we have exascale machines. Okay, so they identify grand challenge areas, which I, I won't go through in detail, protein design, genome design, materials design. Uh, you can accelerate climate, cosmology, and quantum chemistry calculations using these, these things, uh, quantum computing, precision optimization of manufacturing, uh, and pot potentially reasoning over mathematical literature to solve problems, which was one of the early AI applications many years ago. So what they identified was six emerging capabilities, which were uh, these surrogate models, which means you can use AI instead of solving the equations, and it goes, you get augmented simulations. Whoops, sorry. What am I? Yes. I want that. Yeah. Augmented simulations. You can also do uh, find out what proteins and drugs and things. You can either go find out, you can say what properties you want and design a drug, or you can find a, a molecule and find out what properties it has. So you can do these sort of problems here. Software engineering, you can do quite a lot there. Autonomy, things can happen automatically. So you can program things so you don't have to intervene all the time because it understands, it gets data, and then it updates what you need to do. And these are often called digital twins. They're just very accurate simulations of a particular system, for example, an airplane, or maybe one of these days of a human being, people are looking at things like that. And then robotics, how you do robotics in various, con in various contexts. So it's possible many of these use cases could be done if you could build a foundation model for science, you could do all of these things uh, using a foundation model. And that's the sort of vision that Rick Stevens, who's a deputy lab, lab director at Argonne, talks about. So foundation models for science, uh, he's already done something. So he produced a, a thing called uh, uh, Genome Scale Language Model, Gen SLM. And, and he's fed it with, with data to do with COVID uh, and the genetics and, and, and uh, the, the actual, um, what do I want to call it? But, but the, the relevant genetic information to do with this and what it's able to do is is reveal for example what the function of the organization within the gene so you can actually do science with that so it's trained on a very small subset of science very specific area but you can nonetheless do something sen sensible and if you could do for science train it on science material science corpus of all the things we do you could do all sorts of things you can do summaries and things like that which it, it's very good at you can synthesize multiple sources. You can generate plans, logic, and matrix protocols. 
and you may be able to generate hypotheses which it can then go and test. So do research, perhaps like a human. So one of the questions that worries me is, uh, I've talked about how you, in order these things you need huge amounts of data and you need huge amounts of compute. The IT companies I showed you, the hyperscalers, can do that and that's what they're doing. And so how does academia compete with this? These all have advantages. They have large private data sets they're never going to share with you. Uh, they have uh, hundreds of computer scientists with PhDs, machine learning and AI, and they essentially have unlimited computing power. So I think it is worth thinking about what we can do in a university uh, and how we can make a contribution to this. And, and I think we do need, I think it does need the university's community researchers finding out what the limitations of these models, are they dangerous, what can it do, what it can't do, what are the guardrails and so on. And that's what the debate you have around you now. So. Um, Here's an advert for a, a, a book I've just compiled, uh, AI, Artificial Intelligence for Science, uh, and people who want it can get a 35% discount off it. I can give you the code for doing that. Uh, I, but the hardback costs you a lot of money. The e-version the, the e is, is much cheaper. What is in it? Well, it, it's, it's uh, if you like, these are keynotes at a, at a conference. You have something on fo protein folding, uh, AI and astronomy, you have uh, experimental facilities, uh, exascale computer, and you also have, here we are, this is to do with the LIGO experiments, Barry Barish is the only Nobel Prize winner we have in this list, um, unlike the, the Stag Lectures, which has five Nobel Prize winners, one of whom was one of my most famous babysitters. Right? <laughs> the other famous babysitter was the son of a professor here, who now is the drummer of Coldplay, and and the Gerard de Tuft when I was at Caltech was a babysitter for me, which uh, I think is a good symbol that he's a human after all. Okay, so uh, what's in the book? Uh, uh, it, it looks at application domains here, looks at the ecosystem, and looks at perspective large language models, and it looks at the interface of machine learning, which gives you correlations, but isn't causal. It doesn't actually guarantee that it's causally effect this actually causes that just gives you a correlation so uh, an automated experiment so there's a lot of in and self-driving cars and so on so you can uh, from that you can distill surprisingly this is what we looked at when we had that uh, we found that deep learning played a much bigger role than we thought we thought it would be a much broader set of machine learning algorithms but deep learning was by far the most dominant and uh, uh, you had uh, image-based systems for astronomy, pathology, and so on, graph-based systems, dense systems, time series, uh, and, and other things. But there was a relatively small number, less than 10, that you could do, and you could actually design, uh, uh, if you like, a chat GPT thing, a reasoner or, or scientific assistant to actually uh, learn how to use these things most efficiently. So, a transformation of scientific research. So let's just quickly finish up. Alpha fold is protein folding. So you know the sequence of, 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 of proteins, in a, a sequence of, of molecules in a protein, but how does it fold up? Because the shape of a protein determines its function. For a drug, can a drug fit in? Can a virus fit in? You all know the, the picture of the COVID virus and so on. Uh, and so these guys at Google's DeepMind in London solve this problem. So this is just some comments, working on this problem for 50 years. This is the guy who set up the, the experiments they have every two years to test what the best protein folding one. It's now finished because it's now solved, right? Uh, we're wondering if we ever get there. This is what uh, Nobel laureate and president of the Royal Society, a stunning advance, 50 year old grand challenge per decade before many people would have predicted. This is from uh, ex-CEO of Gen Genentech, which is a a, gen a, 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 a biology company making use of these things. AlphaFold, one in generation advanced predicting protein structures with incredible speed, much promise for accelerating drug discovery. So what they've done since then, they've made these things available. You can actually go and run these things. Uh, and they've also done it for things that we don't know the structure for. So 350,000 un- proteins which don't know the structure, they've just predicted the structure and made it available at the uh, EBI near Cambridge. 
and this is what the director says, this will be one of the most important data sets since the mapping of the human genome. So really significant progress. And I think that's actually likely to win a Nobel Prize. Interesting, do you give an AI system a Nobel Prize? Not clear. Uh, and self-driving lab laboratories. So this is things that they can do now at the, at, at, at the lab. You can take your molecule and, and you just give it them and they put it in the apparatus and it gives you the answer at the end. And, the, and that's all you have to do. It's all done automatically. Can you make that so it then can take the output and then decide what the next experiment is and do it? Can you have sort of, uh, you know, experiments done as a service using these um, uh, autonomous systems? And that's one of the things people are excited about. And since it's the astronomy group, I thought I found this uh, from 13th of October, which claims that the first supernova detected, confirmed, classified and shared by artificial intelligence. All right. Uh, an important step forward. Now robots to do this. And, the, uh, and I particularly like this sentence, which I wasn't sure all my astronomy friends would, would, would enjoy. Ultimately, removing humans from the loop provides more time for the research team to do uh, so instead of doing, taking data in beautiful places, you sit in the lab here and analyze the data that it gives you. Okay, a couple of slides to finish. What about artificial intelligence? I've talked about how we have something that works. We don't quite know why it works, and I would encourage you to trust, distrust it a bit. But uh, there are two people, um, two types of things. One is weak AI, which a system acts as if it understands. What the problem is and the other is strong ai which is actually thinking all right so um we have for example the turing test this is a a, a film the imitation game with benedict cumberbatch uh, and so if you could tell whether you were corresponding with a human or a computer that was alan turing's turing test and then you could say you had intelligence well i think we can in certain cases certainly do that with chat gpt doesn't do it in all cases but you can imagine now, uh, and this is an interesting thing, this is Google's equivalent called Bard chatting with ChatGPT. So here it is. Hi, I'm Bard, large language model from Google. Hello, Bard. Nice to meet another language model. Thank you for your kind words. I'm excited to work with you. Absolutely. So uh, this is artificially constructed because you put in a question and, and this guy, Andrew Smart, copied the answer out and fed it into chat GPT. This is its answer. So it copied it out and fed it into Bard. But it is, if you like, a dialogue between two AI systems. Right? And uh, uh, it's interesting that reminds me a little bit. I don't know how many of you read Neuromancer, which took me, I had to read it three times to understand that it was about two dueling AI systems. But that's what it's about. And that could be this. So is this intelligent? Playing chess. Everybody thinks that needs to be smart to play chess. Well, actually, Deep Blue, beat, this is a computer built by IBM just to play chess. And uh, it did so by brute force. So it just could look further ahead than a human because it could have so much computing power. And so that is not really intelligent. It's just just doing more, more deep analysis of this position and could do it more than a human can do in a certain amount of time. And then there was this thing uh, in, in 2011, IBM built this system not to play chess, but to play a game called Jeopardy. Jeopardy is a strange game. It's enormously popular in the States, but as far as I know, not many people know about it in the UK. And it was because there were these big scandals in quiz masters, because they had all these quiz shows, you know, win a million here. and, and of course, it got very exciting because you had this person who was on week after week and you, you quite liked them and so on. And then they had to, within 60 seconds, answer this question and the clock went round and they magically got the answer with two seconds to spare. It's because the, the TV channels had realised you didn't want to get these people off the thing because they were so popular, they were bringing the audience in because they liked these people. And so they had fed the answers to these people so that it looked like they were wondering what the hell it was. And then two seconds to spare, they give you the answer. So that was a big scandal. And you couldn't do a quiz program in the States ever again, was, was what they thought. But this is a program which was devised um, by a guy who was thinking, what can we do? And his wife said, well, you know, 
why don't you, instead of asking for a question and asking for the answer, why don't you give them the answer and ask for the question? For example, if I said 53280, what's the question? Number of feet in a mile, all right? That's a very simple example, but, uh, but they had all sorts of categories. So for example, in military, uh, in, in a, I haven't got it here, but you could have a military ranks, right? And, and, the, and the clue was um, painful form of punishment. And the answer is, corporal all right and so that's it became rather it wasn't direct like the 5320 that's too obvious so they had very complicated things and ibm built this system uh, to do that and this is a system it played the two best jeopardy players here they are and they lost this is ibm deep ibm watson here and this is a, a typical board that you can pick your things uh, and uh, what the guy who invented it, David Ferrucci, said, make it more interesting if under him, before he gave his answer, we predicted what his first choice, his second choice, and second choice with, with probabilities. And from that, you could see that he got it right most of the time. But also you could see from the second and third choices, it had absolutely no idea what it was talking about. It, they were just random things, and it hadn't understood the question at all. And so um, it's not intelligent. And, and this is what philosopher John Searle says in Berkeley, uh, Chinese room paradox. You have this guy here putting Chinese symbols in here, asking questions, and this guy here getting the answers. And he says he's getting perfect answers, which means this, this, this person, this box contains something that really understands it. Of course, it doesn't because it has a person there looking at what the symbol, uh, look in this book, it tells me if I get that symbol, I put out that symbol. So he's just actually just doing what he's told. So there's no understanding in that. And, and what he said about Jeopardy, he says, Watson didn't even know it was playing Jeopardy, let alone he lost, all right, and so on. And then, you know, what's the future you like? Well, R2-D2 saves the world and, and can talk to you and take autonomous actions. Maybe it'll be like that. Or it could be something like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Skynet, uh, you know, AIs, because AIs will control weapon systems. And this is where the AI suddenly decides the best thing to do for humanity is to wipe it out, right? Because it's always going to be killing each other. So, uh, uh, and then Skynet and, and the Terminator is a result. Or alternatively, you could fall in love with the computer, right? You have your assistant as a nice, nice name, depending on your sexual orientation. And this is a case of uh, uh, Joachim Phoenix falling in love with the computer, which he'd given a, a female name. And then he got very disillusioned because she got bored because he could only manage one conversation and she could manage millions. So she was being unfaithful to him on a scale of millions. Right? So ended up very disillusioned. So you can have two views of the future. The singularity is near. Ray Kurzweil is one of the sort of gurus, which I don't trust this and I don't believe this at all. But, but this, he says that, you know, we're going to have computers which are more smart than human beings and it'll change everything and, and, and so on. And he's trying all sorts of efforts to keep, keep alive till this happens, the singularity he calls it. Well, I, I, also, I also believe that no lecture is complete without a mention of my favorite physicist, Richard Feynman, all right? So Richard Feynman, people may not know, but he's famous for the lectures on physics, which I really recommend to you and they're really great things, but they're also, he wrote his last five years of his life, he lectured on computing. And his analogy to a computer was that you, it was just like a file clerk, where you, you say file clerk goes to the filing cabinet, takes out a card, and it says, do this. So he goes over here, writes something there, puts the card back, goes to another card, it says multiply it by this, and puts it there, and, and, and you just do back and forth. And it's really dumb. It's just doing what you tell it to. It's, it's as dumb as it could possibly be. He calls it a dumb file clerk. Uh, and the inside of a computer is as dumb as hell. But because it goes so damn fast, it looks like it's intelligent, right? But it really is just doing routine things. So that's nearer my view of where we are. Um, but I do feel my last slide um, inside of a computer is as dumb as hell but it goes like mad. But nonetheless, what I would say is AI won't replace the scientists, but scientists who use AI 
will replace those who don't. Thank you very much for listening. You've been very patient. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. I'll be quickly learning about AI. Um, right, so we have a bit of time now for questions. We'll start by taking questions from the audience and we also have some questions coming online. So if you can please put your hand up and then my wonderful PhD student will run around with the microphone. I think so. The Jeffrey Hinton, who invented these learning networks, is now warning against them. Says they're too dangerous. Okay, thanks for your talk. So uh, I'm a fourth uh, last year PhD student. So I already finished my PhD, and uh, at the beginning of the uh, this year, so I started doing the AI stuff, try to basically solve the PDEs. Uh, and we already had a paper and uh, we submit a workshop paper for AI for science. So my question is, so for some PhD students or some just young PhD who want to keep this uh, topic, like uh, try to combine the AI with the, the physics kind of stuff, is there any findings specific for us? Because I feel like it's very frustrating that uh, if we want to apply some positions in like, uh, uh, computer size. We are not good in fundamental model stuff, but if we want to stay in the uh, our old uh, subjects like physics, usually theory group they are very poor, and uh, we are so they are maybe they are not interested. So, is there any findings or in the future they can give for us for those who is uh, try to bridge the uh, physics content and the AI? So that would no, be perfect. I, I understand you're saying it, it, it's it's I think a problem with multidisciplinary science is that uh, you could argue you know you have the computer science you have to go to the EPSRC but if you want to do biology you go to BBSC and so you have two two boards evaluating proposal and EPSRC say oh we like the proposal but obviously it should be funded by BBSRC who say the same thing you know it should be funded by EPSRC, and so you get turned down by two boards, not one, all right? Uh, so I think there are the challenges, and um, I don't think, I think they're trying to address these things, but I don't think it's quite there yet. But I think uh, you could start a dialogue or, with your professor or whatever it is with EPSRC. And, and they're the people who have the computer science AI technology. But if you want to work with environmental scientists, as I would like to do, then I have to work with NERC. And that's something that, in principle, UKRI could fix. But UKRI, as far as I can see, has not yet fixed it. So uh, I don't know exactly the UK funding situation. But I sympathize, and I would encourage you to persevere. But it's quite difficult, because multidisciplinary you're neither a physicist nor a computer scientist. You're sort of in between, and it becomes difficult. So I'm sorry not to be more encouraging, but I would encourage you, but it's tough. Cheers. Uh, right, one line question. Right. We actually have a few coming in. Uh, right, so the first one says, how will AI and deep learning influence our future ways of teaching and learning? That's a, no, that is a key question. Uh, how this university, uh, I'm, I'm glad Mark's here, so you have obviously got this into control. Um, but but uh, no, it, it's it's tricky. I think um, one of my friends is a guy named Yiki Guo, who used to be at Imperial College. Just before the Chinese came down heavy on Hong Kong, he took a position at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And he's now trying to integrate AI and chat GPT into all of the science an educational curriculum, HKUST. And I think that's it's it's a challenge because you don't want people just to parrot things out. You need them to be able to understand it. And uh, my worry, one of my worries about, I have lots of worries, but one of my worries is, is about deep fakes. You don't know what's real. You haven't got a watermark to know that this is a real opinion because I can make a video of you saying something that you absolutely don't believe. And it looks just right. It looks like you, it looks like you're talking. It sounds like your voice but you're saying the opposite of what you believe, and that can really happen. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the US election in a couple of years. Uh, 
uh, yeah, a couple, uh, no, next year, actually, next year, uh, and also in the UK. So I think real challenges. So I don't have an easy answer, but I think it's something that, that I think the university would be willing to go and engage with, because I think it has to engage that this thing is out there. What are you going to do? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, so we just discussed how intelligence and hello. Here. Yeah, got you. Um, intelligence and computers and how it could or could not be real. So how would you define intelligence and humans? How do I what? How would you define intelligence and humans? Well, that's what Turing tried to do. He said, well, intelligence is very complicated, so why don't I do a, a sort of pragmatic thing? If I can't tell whether it's I'm asking questions of a machine or a person, then it's obviously intelligent, all right? Uh, and that was his test. I think that's too narrow a definition. Uh, I think you want more than that. But it is very difficult to, to, to understand. One of the slides I didn't use is, is, is from a guy named Daniel Dennett, who's a famous philosopher of science, uh, who, who believes that you know consciousness is is the real key frontier. So if you are, if you are sentient, are you conscious? Well, I, I think we're a long way from that, and that's why I gave this weak AI and strong AI discussion at the end. There are these two schools, and I don't believe we've got uh, a strong AI system which is independent and can answer like R two D two or Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever. We we, we haven't got there yet. Okay. So unsatisfactory i know but i don't think it's easy to define these things fair enough that's right another question online uh someone is interested to hear your take on whether ai poses an, an existential threat to humanity okay yes uh, okay so will ai uh you know cause the extinction of humanity and this is you know not a joke because there's a letter by people like Elon Musk and uh, uh, and Jeffrey Hinton and a whole bunch of other luminaries who said that we should have a pause because uh, the guy who invented it all, Jeffrey Hinton, has just been amazed at the advances that have been made. And he's really scared by the fact that you have GPT-4 now, which has so much data in there, so much knowledge, more than you or I could possibly absorb. And he sees that you could have these systems in every country and you could have the systems together would know far more than any human does. And is that going to be guaranteed it's more intelligent? Don't know, but uh, but he's sufficiently worried that these things need to be thought about carefully. And I think the government and and Rishi Sunak has a big thing on AI next, next week or something like that, where he's getting large numbers of people to, to think about that. Uh, I, I don't know, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I do have a pragmatic view is that I, want to have some people in the UK doing research on unethical AI because people are going to use unethical AI, North Korea, China, Russia, against us. We need to have some people, GCHQ perhaps or whatever, who actually understand what you do if they attack you with some things which are using things unethically. Uh, and I think that's one of the challenges. Uh, so how we control it i don't know but i would like academics to be able to explore the limitations and at the moment i see that being prevented because it's huge amounts of data and huge amounts of computing and we don't have funds to do that and there's no way we can train a system we can accept from open ai or from google a system already trained but we don't choose what data it's being trained on i think we should be able to train data systems on on, on subsets of data or even science data or philosophy data, whatever you want, but it should be something we could explore. That's what academics role is. And I think it's very difficult to see how that happens nowadays. Thank you. Oh, so uh, thank you. I, I work in the health and medical field. Um, and typically it takes many years to bring things into practice uh, due to uh, things needing peer review, uh, evidence and so on. Um, you described machines that can potentially dictate their next course of action, dictate the next experiment, etc. I just wondered how that squares in the future to bring things into practice where machines are making decisions, shall we say, and yet the, 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 the traditional methods take many years to bring into practice and need the evidence behind them. Well, uh, IBM Watson, one of its first applications after winning Jeopardy, which was clearly a loss leader for it, uh, was uh, to apply it to medicine. And of course, uh, 
uh, it can know all the, the cases and you can train it on these things, but, but it, it failed because people wouldn't, it came up with the prediction, which actually person disagreed with, but you couldn't find out why it came up with that. And actually people didn't trust it. And that's why eventually it was not a profitable thing for, 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 for Watson to do. Um, I do think there are some areas where it, it's absolutely useful. I think, um, for example, looking at images for, for cancer and things like that, I think it's, it's good for that. For drug design, I think it will help drug companies design things more quickly, but you're absolutely right. The whole process of getting the thing accepted is very complicated. Maybe that can be speeded up, but it's very difficult to, to, to know. So um, it, it's, it's, it's not obvious, there were pluses and minuses. Uh, and I think that um, we will have to wait and see uh, in, in small steps. There have been some successes of drugs being designed by AI, but not many. And I, and, uh, I don't know how real those were, but, but certainly people are looking at that. But, but you're right, then they have human trials and all this sort of stuff. So it's, it's a complicated thing. I, I don't think I'd choose human trials as my first target, yeah. I'm afraid. Right. So the, the person that asked the question before, uh, thank you for your thoughtful answer. Um, and then we have another one that says whether AI can build a quantum computer. Okay, well, all right. I, I presume you've all read my introduction to quantum computing, which I wrote uh, when I was at Southampton uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, 18 years ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, but okay, so I, I'm interested in quantum computing. I, I think it's a very exciting thing, but, but I, I think it's a long way from being practical. Yes, you will find all sorts of people starting companies, you will people saying you can do AI with quantum computers, you will have classical computers a bit on the quantum computer and the classical computer. I just think that's all premature because it turns out that there's a thing in, in, in computer science called memory error corrections, where a one has flipped to a zero by a cosmic ray or whatever. And so you have these error correction protocols and you have that in, 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 in qubits, quantum bits, which can be not only one and zero, but, but anything in between a complex number. And so you have phases and, and actually protecting against error correction in a quantum computer requires, you know, orders of magnitudes more for a physical error corrected qubit, you need large numbers of logical qubits. And so to do something like the original reason was, 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 uh, factorizing large numbers, right? Because that's the basis of our uh, security system called RSA. Our bank accounts are protected by the fact that it's, it's very easy to multiply two large numbers, but it's very difficult to factorize a large number into its two prime numbers. And um, to do that on a reasonable scale will require many, many millions of qubits, many millions of gates, and they're error corrected, all right? So, I think we've got a hundred, maybe we can get a thousand qubits. We're a long way from having, uh, in my view, a serious computer system. So that's why people are looking at what they call noisy intermediate scale quantum computers, where you don't correct qubits and you can do some things. It's a question of what you can do with those. And I think a lot, I think a lot of the discussion is premature, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I mean, I was interested in quantum computing because I've never been quite happy with the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, things like Schrodinger's cat, decoherence and stuff like that. So I am interested in quantum computing and certainly understanding things at the atomic scale is what you need to do to start nanotechnology. And that was another thing that Feynman suggested, nanotechnology. Hi, um, for context, I am a first year in Southampton. Um, so uh, I'm really interested in like the research community for artificial intelligence. So uh, I've tried reading some research papers, but I couldn't wrap my head around it. So how would you advise uh, someone who's really keen into it, research and uh, understanding what the researchers our uh, papers are about. 
Okay, well, first of all, I mean, uh, it's a worthwhile ambition, all right? Uh, but uh, in order to really understand something, uh, you need to know in great depth, and typically these things have mathematics underneath, so you need to have a really good control of mathematics. So first of all, uh, and second of all, and third of all, I, I, I would recommend you understanding the mathematics so you understand the mathematics behind these statistical systems, behind deep learning systems as far as we know, and so on. Uh, but you need to have a mentor, right? So uh, which department are you in? Uh, ECS. My old department. You see my picture on the wall, I hope. <laughs> um, um, uh, yes. So, well, go and nag the computer scientists that there's a head of AI there go go and talk to him and say you know what should you recommend is there a summer school I could go to maybe you have to pay for it yourself maybe you can you know get help to do it but I think if you're interested there's no reason for you necessarily to go at the snail's pace of an undergraduate degree if you if you're really serious you can go faster but you, but you have to go and find out there are online things you can do uh, for example, Andrew Ung has lots of courses on Coursera and things like that. But but I think it's much more difficult without somebody as a mentor. So uh, go and ask them. Thank you. Okay. We're going to have the last two questions, one online and one in the audience. I'm impressed by your stamina, by the way. Uh, right. Uh, someone uh, asked, what guidelines do you suggest for the use of ChatGPT by students and particularly teenagers? Well, I think a lot of use for teenagers, I would have thought, yes. Um, uh, well, I would, um, I, I, I think there are, well, I think it's worth experimenting with chat GPT. Uh, I, I, I don't know, I can see it in an academic context, uh, in a social context. Well, I'm sure you can produce really wonderful fake images, right? So that you could really do. I don't recommend it. You can produce fake videos. That's not a good thing either. Uh, uh, and um, but maybe you need to understand the limits of those things. Um, maybe you can teach it to play, you know, uh, your favorite video game. Uh, it's not sure I have. People should email Matt afterwards, uh, and I will uh, try and answer some questions I haven't thought about. What should a teenager do with chat GPT? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I certainly don't have the answers. Okay, the last question, please. Okay. Uh, so my question was just, do you have any information about or any perspectives on um, how you could go about trying to implement some kind of metacognition into computer programs? in order to sort of improve their, the, the, you know, the, the, them to better approximate um, more intelligent behavior? Well, okay, I'm not sure I understand fully what metacognition means. I've seen it used in many contexts, but I, I'm not sure. But certainly I, I do believe that these things can assist you in coding, all right, and they can give you a starting point uh, and uh, people are using them. And so there must be a community, which I'm not a part of, who use these systems in, in coding and software engineering. Um, what did you mean by metacognition exactly? So the idea that the, so the, idea that the um, computer program itself can sort of interrogate its own thinking to sort of improve the way it addresses a problem. Well, I mean, these systems do get better. I, I'm not sure that I think it fully under... It, it doesn't understand things, right? So, but I, I think it, it can learn from experience. So I, I'm not sure I have a, a satisfactory answer to that. I would like just to say, um, in the early days of AI, there were these, these McCarthy and, and uh, Minsky at MIT, along with another guy called, uh, uh, who, who was the guy who invented the, the internet, his name was Licklider, professor of psychology at MIT. He, he ran the, 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 the DARPA thing, which set up the, the first ARPANET, which became the internet. So he had the idea for doing it. Um, but his view was a human-computer symbiosis, that you'd actually have 
very intelligent computer systems knowing lots of stuff because it, it does it, it's infallible it doesn't it doesn't forget things like we do it knows it can read all literature and say well there's you know in le legal experience are there pre previous cases well they they can find them in the way that we can't so the, these systems can be assistance for you so i think a personal assistant uh, ai system a, a, as in call of duty with the you know uh, in his own spacesuit is is not incredible so i believe that's where i see that there's humans being assisted by a, a personal assistant who knows things that uh, who can tell you in your ear oh this is so and so and so and so and, and you met him at a meeting three years ago in in dubrovnik and uh, ask about his children or whatever you know so it can it can give you all these clues because it's more difficult for me because i forget names uh, they're on disc and it takes time to recall them all right uh, so I, I think symbiosis would you have a an intelligence system in in conjunction with a person is i think my personal view of where these things will go uh, whether they're dangerous i don't see them as dangerous as hinton and, and musk and people like that but uh, i could be wrong Thank you very much. Okay, so just to demonstrate our thanks, as is obligatory for a, a stag lecture, I don't think Tony's aware of this, uh, we give a, a small gift. Um, so as I give it, please put round, yeah, your hands together for Tony to thank him very much. Thank you, Tony. Oh, well, there you are. Well, there right. you are. And just before we go, um, a big thanks, please, to all the organizers, everyone who's helped from Tony Sims, uh, Barbara and Tracy, especially. Thank you very much. And I assume all you know who the drummer of Coldplay is, right? So. <laughs>